Well, good morning, all. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask that you turn with me uh, to the book of Psalms once again. Uh, we're going to look at Psalm 100 this morning. I'm going to ask that you stand with me for the reading of God's Word this morning. Um, it's a short psalm, uh, but I think a powerful one. It's also up on the screen for us. And I forgot my glasses again. It's a good thing I can stand back a little bit. Uh, psalm 100. A psalm for giving grateful praise. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who has who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. You may be seated. In a more formal liturgical church, a, a visitor showed up one Sunday and got excited about something the minister said and declared, Amen, praise the Lord. And someone tapped him on the shoulder and whispered, We don't praise the Lord in here. <laughs> and, uh, and another member nearby said, Yes, we do. It's on page 15 of the lectionary. <laughs> We're talking about worship this morning. What do you worship? And worship is defined as a reverent, as reverent honor and uh, homage paid to God or a sacred personage or to any object regarded as sacred. To feel an adoring reverence or regard for any person or thing. Now we all worship something or someone in our lives. Something or someone gets our attention uh, and focus. Just, just look at our world. Just look at what goes on in our world. It might be a sports personality or a team. Did you know that 10 athletes made a total of $992 million this year? Just 10 athletes made that kind of money. So you can't tell me that there isn't a bit of hero worship going on there. It may be a, a musician or a band, could be an actor. Um, it may even be a successful business person or a politician. Some estimate, of course, that there are over 4,000 world religions out there. Uh, of course, uh, Statistically, Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism are the top three major religions of the world. But they estimate that 85% of the world population practices some form of religion, which means they practice some form of worship. For us, we have discovered where our worship should rightly be, with our Creator and our King. Psalm 100 is a psalm of thanksgiving. Uh, the psalm begins with the call to make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. What stands out here is that word all. And the end of the psalm tells us that God's steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Taken together, the psalm cries out for people everywhere from all nations and all ages and to enter into worship of God. It comes across as a poetic call of the, the Great Commission to go into the world and make disciples of all nations so that they discover what true worship looks like 
as they discover uh, the true God. John Wesley cried out, we are called to do this by offering them Christ. So what does Psalm 100 teach us about worshiping God? Well, as I, as I was reading this psalm, a couple of questions come to mind. Uh, first off, why should we worship God? Why should we worship God? Why should we come into his presence singing? Well, look at verse 3. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Well, verse 3 simply says we worship the Lord because he is God. Genesis tells us in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1. And in the Gospel of John, uh, he tells us in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.1. 1, 1. And the Apostle Paul said, There is one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Ephesians 4.6. But we don't just worship God because he created us and everything in the universe, although that is a very good reason for worship. Uh, we worship him because of his love for us as well. In verse 5, the author says that God's love for his people lasts forever. And in a very well-known verse, we see the extent of God's love for his people. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. John 3, 16 and 17. God loves the world he created so much. He loves the world so much that he sent his Son to humanity to spread God's message. But Jesus didn't come to curse the world. He didn't come to, 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 to say that God's creation was bad, that it was over with, that it was done. No, he came to redeem the world, he came to rescue us through God's message of love for us. Secondly, we also worship God because we belong to him. It is he who made us and we are his. When we were in elementary school, during the first week of the school year, we had to write our name all over our stuff. You know, our books and our pencil cases and backpacks and all of that. Um, and now they have label makers that make it so much easier. Uh, and you can stick those on your lunch kit, your, uh, your school bag, your pencil box, your probably even your desk, all the stuff in your desk. A young man was buying a shirt in a department store, and the shirt label said, shrink resistant. And he asked the clerk what that meant. And the clerk said, the label means the shirt, that the shirt will shrink, but it doesn't want to. When someone's name is on something, typically it means it belongs to them. The Apostle Paul said in his letter to the Galatians, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Uh, Galatians 3.26. And John said in his first letter, See what great love the Father has on it, lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world did, does not know us is that it does not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. 1 John 3, 1 and 2. And of course, you'll recognize this verse from Genesis 1. It tells us that God created mankind and in His own image. 
In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1.27. God has put his name on us by way of making us. He has also bought us at a great price and has a purpose for us. So we worship God because we belong to him, but we also worship God because of his goodness. For the Lord is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Verse 5. When you look at the, the Greek and Roman worship in ancient times, they, they simply worshiped the gods because they thought they were in charge. And of course, they wanted to please the gods. They wanted to make sure they weren't struck down. Um, and when you look at the, the ancient gods of Greece and Rome, there was no compassion there. There was no love or care for humanity. And of course, of course we know they were deceived. Um, Paul went to Athens to introduce the Athenians to the unknown God. But in the Bible, of course, we discover God's goodness and we discover many of his character traits. The, the Psalms and Scripture itself are filled with description of God's character. God is, is caring, protective, and faithful. Psalm 91.4 says, He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. In first, uh, no, 2 Timothy 4.8, Paul says that God is a righteous judge. And again, in the first letter of John, he says that God is love. 1 John 4.8. In Psalm 99, we're also told that God is holy and forgiving. Lord, Lord our God, you answered them. You were to Israel a forgiving God, though you punished their misdeeds. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Verses 8 and 9. And of course, Paul lists the, the fruit of the Spirit, um, which of course is God's character growing in us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Since we've, I think we've answered the question why. Why should we worship God? Those things, I think, answer that for us. The next question is how. How do we worship God? Verses 1 and 2 says, Shout for, the joy, uh, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Now, first thought in looking at that is that we can worship God by making a joyful noise. For some of us, it is noise. Um, just two psalms before this, the psalmist says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Psalm 98, verses 4 and 6. So, obviously, one of the hows is that we can worship in song. We can, we can bring our praise in song. But, of course, we want to do that with a pure heart. We, want, we don't want to just make noise for noise sake. We want to come in adoration, in humility, in love. In the late 1990s, in Waterford, England, Matt Redmond's church had a high caliber praise band and worship team. Yet the pastor knew the congregation had lost its way in worship. So the pastor asked, when you come through the doors on a Sunday, what are you bringing as your offering to God? 
Matt Redman said the question led initially to some embarrassing silence. Eventually, heartfelt prayers and heart-driven songs were sung as they experienced God in a fresh way. Through that experience, Matt wrote this, uh, this song, and, and I think you'll recognize the lyrics. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it, when it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. And after a little while, they reintroduced the band, the praise team, and so on. And with the renewed focus and intensity, the corporate time became authentic. Worship from the heart is not about the newest latest, greatest, or hottest songs on the charts. It's not about the oldest, most obscure, or well-known song. In fact, true worship is not about a song at all. It's about a son. It's about our bringing to him my soul, my life, and my all. God loves to hear from us, both in prayer and praise. Uh, in a conversation taking place between the, the man healed from blindness and the Pharisees, he tells them, we know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. John 9, 31. So we worship through our voices. We worship even when we speak, when we pray. We worship in song, and we worship in noise. <laughs> but we also worship through service. In uh, verse 2 of the English Standard Version of Psalm 100, it says, Serve the Lord with gladness. The Hebrew word for service is abad, A-B-A-D. It's defined as serving, worshiping, working in ministry. It also refers to plowing and cultivating. So when we're serving God, we're, we're digging up the soil of our lives and allowing God to sow seeds of faith within us. A.W. Tozer said, What is worship? Worship is to feel in your heart and express in some appropriate manner a humbling but delightful sense of admiring awe an astonished wonder and overpowering love in the presence of the most ancient mystery, that majesty which philosophers call the first cause, but which we call our Father, which art in heaven. Worship is an acknowledgement that God is alive and working in our lives. And that can be done by both singing to him and serving him through our daily lives. If we are serving others begrudgingly, then it is not worship. Professor and author Douglas J. Moo wrote, Worship is not merely or even mainly what we do on Sunday morning. Worship is a 24-7 matter. We worship God when we give ourselves to him in service. We worship God when we show love to others, when we do our jobs faithfully and with integrity when we play with our kids and nurture our families. God wants us always to be bringing glory to him by the way we live. He says our knowledge of Christ and our relationship to him and with him is attractive, so much so that others are drawn to the mysterious. They are drawn to that something about you which haunts their thoughts and whets their appetite for what you possess. As we go about our daily lives with its demands and challenges and in the process of life demonstrate joy and peace when we respond to humanity's pain and needs around us, a fragrance is released. People wonder, what was that? Why did you do that? Why do you care what happens to me? The fragrance of the knowledge of Christ is released and lives are touched and changed. It's in these moments 
we become living and holy sacrifices in these moments we worship. Now, more can be said about how we worship. Like we have the ability to draw close to God, whether we're alone or together in a group. It's also about having the, the right mindset when we come to worship com corporately as the body of Christ. And worship, of course, is lifelong. It never ends. We, we never stop worshiping God. No matter if we can sing well or not, no, no matter how old we are, uh, we can continue to lift our voices in praise and thanksgiving. As well, uh, if it hasn't been said or hasn't been understood, worship is transforming. It changes us. We should leave changed when we gather together to worship God corporately. We should leave changed when we end up in the mountains and we're sitting there by a creek side and saying, praise the Lord. Your creation is good. Serving changes us. And of course it changes those we serve, but it should change us too. Worshiping God is, is really foundational to a life in Christ. This psalm reminds us of the reason we come before God joyfully or gratefully. That's because God is our creator and he loves us with an everlasting love. Jesus is the living embodiment of God's love that was fully expressed by his going to the cross. As I mentioned at the beginning, something or someone will always get our worship. There is no one worthier of it than God. We belong to him. We are his children. We need to stop worshiping self-sufficiently, self-sufficiency and rely on God's sufficiency to sustain us. How do you characterize your worship of God? If you're questioning yourself at all about your worship, take some time to read his words. Spend some time in scripture. Just, just read. Just read it. See how the Spirit speaks. Sing some songs, even if you're by yourself. Even if you don't think you have a great voice, it doesn't matter. Just go ahead and sing. He, as I said, he loves a joyful noise. Praise him for who he is. Praise him for what he has done in your life. Thank him. And of course, make a point of helping someone else in Jesus' name. Make sure your worship is where it should be. Let's pray. Lord God, we, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, God, for your word and, and that simple reminder that you are worthy of our praise, that you are worthy of our adoration. And forgive us, Lord, if we don't come enough before you, whether it's together or alone. So Lord God, we want to say thank you this morning. We want to say thank you for your gift of life to us, your gift of salvation to us, rescuing us, being with us in every part of our lives, God. Thank you for our families. Thank you for our homes. Thank you for how you provide for us, God. Thank you for the beauty of your creation, and that your creation is still good and that you still work in and through us. And Lord, we pray that others will see the joy in our faces 
and hear the praise from our lips. And Lord, that salvation will come not just to your world, not, not just to our country, not just to our city, but even into our neighborhood, even into our homes, God. Even if it's just through simply bringing praise to you. Continue to be with us here, God, as we continue our worship together as the body of Christ. And thank you. Thank you that we have a place where we can gather any day of the week and we can gather and bring joy and praise to your name. But I also thank you that we don't have to just be here. That we can bring joy and praise to your name in the park. We can bring joy and praise to your name in a backyard. We can even bring joy and praise to your name in our cars when we're alone, driving, wherever it might be. So God, speak, Holy Spirit, for we are listening today. We are listening and we want to sing out praise to you, God, whether it's loudly or in our hearts, in our thoughts. Be with us now, I pray, in Jesus' holy name. Amen.